Hello. Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Starship Operations and Beyond seminar. I am Rob McCrary, the creative director of Starfinder. And let's introduce our other panelists today. John. Hi, I'm John Compton. I'm the Starfinder senior developer who works on a lot of hardcover books. I joined the team about a year ago. And Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Pacini. I'm the Starfinder lead designer, and I'm waving enthusiastically to everyone right now. And Lou. Hi, I'm Lou. I'm an editor, uh, and I'm also waving. <laughs> All right, so we are here. We got a lot of stuff to talk about on this panel today. Um, it's called Starship Operations and Beyond. So our first thing we wanted to do was show off the new Starship Operations Manual, which is coming out this summer. So if we can have the next slide, and maybe John, you want to give a short introduction about this book? Yeah, all right. So. The Starship Operations Manual really follows up on one of the core pillars of what Starfinder has been from the very beginning. If you look back to the core rulebook, there's a whole chapter on Starship combat. The idea that you as a group can pile into one, maybe even more starships, and fly around in space, make pew pew sounds, maneuver, um, to use counterintelligence operations and things like that, uh, to do all sorts of cool space battles. And although the core rulebook introduces everything you need to run a really cool starship combat, there's always been more opportunity, more space to expand on uh, all the rules and options and even tropes uh, that exist in sci-fi and science fantasy. So Starship Operations Manual really is an opportunity to explore those and to say, why don't we have this thing? Well, now we can. So uh, it's been a really exciting project to revisit all of the great feedback that we've gotten over the years about Starship combat and to incorporate some of those to, um, you know, redirect a little bit and to open up new opportunities and ways to play. So that's coming out in just a couple of months. And if you can see the the art up on there, that is that is from the cover of the Starship Operations Manual. Um, I should also say, I, I neglected to say this at the beginning, we're not only going to be talking about starships and starship operations. This is Starship Operations and Beyond. So we're going to be talking a little bit about Alien Archive 4, which comes out later this year. Um, another little bit about a book we haven't announced yet um, officially, but we'll talk about. And then we have a special announcement at the end of the panel. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, let's see, John, do you want to, maybe you can go around first and, and kind of get like one thing about the Starship Operations Manual that people on the panel here find exciting or, or something. So what, what do you think, what are, what are you most excited about? So I remember uh, demoing a game at a convention a couple of years ago, uh, shortly after I moved out to Seattle, where I was given a little starship and I ran out of options. And I was just like, I want to just ram into somebody. This is a demo. I don't care what happens to my ship. Just let me pile into this other opponent. And it didn't have rules for it. Uh, and so having something about being able to ram into somebody and even do stuff after that has been a big sticking point for me. And we were able to explore that a little bit in uh, the recently released Near Space book, which has ramming weapons. Uh, one of the things though that Starship Operations Manual does is it expands on ramming some, it, it opens up a few more options and strategies, especially if you're the pilot and you're the one with the pedal on the, or the, the foot on the gas. Um, but also it provides some follow-up things that you can do after ramming, namely, oh, you've rammed into somebody? What if you had a whole bunch of people on board your starship that could then pile into the enemy starship and board them? Uh, so we now have rules in Starship Operations Manual for boarding, and it's wild. Uh, all the different ways that you can start it and all the ways that can resolve and what you as the PCs and the officers can do as part of that to resolve boarding in a variety of different ways. Cool. Let's move to the next slide. And... Uh... Maybe, Joe, do you have something you want to say about the book? Anything that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, there are a couple of subsystems that I'm excited to talk about. I'm sure we'll get to them in a bit here. But uh, personally, I actually I love that we have 40 new starships in this book because for each of these, there's not just stats. Um, you know, a pre-built starship is always nice because then you don't have to figure out all the build points and, and uh, power core units that you might not, not feel like doing a spreadsheet for on occasion. But... They also have like really rich histories and interesting ties to the lore. 
Um, there's a lot. Uh, I won't spoil too much. Talk about manufacturers, but that's tied into it a bit. Um, and so I'm just excited for people to see not just the starships that I wrote, which I do have the soft spot in my heart for, but uh, we just had so many people write so many interesting starships for this book, uh, all of which have really awesome art uh, that I'm just really excited uh, for people to see that and then riff on it and customize those ships and tell more stories using those than we could have come up with ourselves. Yeah, we've got some, uh, some art of one of those starships coming up here a little bit later in the panel. Lou, is there anything about this book that you're particularly excited about? Heck yeah, there is. I'm excited about monsters, as usual, as is my uh, general motives. Um, basically, just monsters, man. <laughs> you know me. That's I'm true, yeah. About, um... I'm sorry? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm, like, really excited about the new weapon types and stuff. Uh, Colossus which is pretty rad. Nice. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Speaking of new weapons, let's move to the next slide Heck because yeah. this is a pretty cool um, thing here. I'll, I'll say really quickly, one of the things that I find uh, exciting about this book is uh, both manufacturers, which someone mentioned, which we'll get to in a moment, and also um, I'm going to hold off because I'm going to let John talk about this slide first of all, <laughs> and then I'll go back and talk about the other thing that I like. I mean, I'm, I'm just tickled with how this art came out. Uh, this is a half page illustration that uh, shows it up in our super colossal starship section, um, which also talks about spinal weapons. So basically if you want to have the cannon that runs the entire length of your six plus mile long starship. Um, and the main thing that I want to point out before I, uh, other people can speak to spinal weapons and, and all the destruction we see is that uh, I specifically included one of our largest um, Eoxian style starships um, in the reference art because I wanted uh, the Conqueror of Worlds uh, Vescarian starship that you see on the right to be obliterating one of our gargantuan or colossal starships from the original core rulebook. Um, just to show the sheer size discrepancy, but also the raw power that some of these things pack. Yeah, and the spinal weapons are just one um, type of new new weapon type and new new things to outfit your starships with. Um, I think you you already talked about the sort of the ramming stuff. Um, trying to think, is there anything else we want to talk about that's really cool in terms of the extra extra starship gear that you can get? Right? Yeah. Oh, there's no end of wonderful things here. Um, what one of the one of the critiques that Starship Combat has received over the years is that there are some roles that have a lot more options of what to do than others, and um, one of the big options that we have in this book in the weapons section are ECMs, electronic countermeasures. Namely, these are science officer weapons that you can put onto weapon mounts and point at other starships to do a variety of different effects. So if you want to hack into an enemy starship, you can. And you can basically turn all of their ICM computer bonuses that they get every round, and they would be like, I apply this plus four to my shooting check. And you can say, no, 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 the computer works for me now. You get a minus four on what I say you get a minus four on. You gain no bonuses. Or they're jamming things where you start to make it so that they can't scan you in turn. Um, or even some weirder stuff than that, because we are a science fantasy game. So you'll find some Magitech-themed uh, ECM-related options as well for the science officer to do some kind of magic-adjacent stuff as well. So I find that that's a really cool option for science officers to explore. Nice. So we had kind of mentioned, I had, I had talked about, or we were asking, I was asking what everyone's favorite things were. And I wanted to mention one thing in there uh, that I was excited that I got to work on some was sort of alternate means of faster than light travel. Of course, in Starfinder, the assumption is everybody's got a drift engine. Triune granted the secrets of the drift to the entire galaxy. But, you know, what about either people that didn't get the signal or people not from this galaxy or people that were traveling in space before the signal went out? and the drift. And so uh, the Starship Operations Manual also presents a number of um, 
new slash old <laughs> in, ter in terms of the, in the game world uh, methods of faster than light travel. A lot of them have to deal with um, going through other planes the same way they go through the drift. They tend to use more magic and everything, but we had kind of hinted at some of these things, like even as far back as the first Alien Archive, where we talked about the Witch Weirds using a uh, planar aperture drive. So we've actually statted up the planar aperture drive that the Witch Weirds use. It is still um, very much restricted to Witch Weirds only. They don't sell it to outsiders. Um, and, and as well as some, some, other, some other interesting ones there. So that's, that was kind of a cool thing to, to look at, you know, what is, what is coming so or... Yeah. So, so one of the things I just saw in chat, Rob, is did we just make drift obsolete? What do you think, Joe? Did we make drift obsolete with these? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We threw away a core mechanic of our game to uh, no. <laughs> no, we just provide a lot of really interesting alternatives that uh, you know NPC ships might use, or that the PCs might stumble across uh, a certain kind of you know their drift engine might be kaput. But hey, look, they found you know some other means of traveling back home uh so it adds a lot of story story elements um while providing some mechanics for those who need them to latch their hooks into yeah and it's not we it's expanded our our lore <laughs> definitely exactly and, and a lot of them have a lot of these other ones have sort of restrictions like i said like with the witch weird one either that only a particular group uses them or you have to you have to somehow be able to do it or you'd have to find it somewhere so it's it's really kind of there for gms and players to play around with as they as they want to to see um let's see what else can we do let's go to the next slide next slide and see what that shows us Ooh. okay john you want to introduce Whatever could it be <laughs> um yeah so um a lot of our when we think about hardcover rule books, it's really easy for us to look at them and say, these will contain rules. Um, but a point that's, that we regularly uh, get across in the Star Chamber, which we, is our informal term for the Starfinder team, is that even our, uh, even our most dense rule books still have setting information included in them. And I wanted to make sure that uh, the Starship Operations Manual was no different. So. Uh, just as Joe said that the starships come with like uh, backstory and history of how they got to the form that they are, we also have a large section about manufacturers. Um, if you look in Starship Armory, for example, you'll find that there are several pages about weapons manufacturers. And not only do they explain where they're based and what they do and what they're known for, but they provide a little perk that you can buy into if you like. So we wanted to see about expressing something kind of similar for our starship manufacturers. So we have explored, I believe it's 20 of the biggest or most influential starship manufacturers in the packed worlds, the Viscarium, and even in some cases beyond to say, okay, what, where did these folks come from? Like, are they pre-drift? Are they somebody who started up in the last 15 years? What's their story? How did they get to where they are? What was their big break? And what are they known for? When I see, for example, the Blood Mountain Clan's logo on the side of somebody's starship, What's the first thing I start to think about? What, is, what does it say about the driver? And on top of that, what sorts of things are they really good at that could convey uh, to me in a mechanical sense? So for each one of these manufacturers, we have a little perk. It's not going to be a game-breaking thing, but it's a little thing to give you a extra flavor about how that manufacturer expresses itself. So it might be that the manufacturer's cargo holds hold more because they're just known for having, you know, that spacious hatchback or whatever. Um, or it could be that they're known for selling uh, super luxuriously kitted out starships. And so luxury quarters for your crew might cost just a few BP fewer. So again, these aren't going to change like the nature of starship combat in any big way, but they're going to be a point of pride and enjoyment as you buy the latest uh, Opelos starship and say, oh yeah, I totally feel like I'm riding in an Opelos ship. Cool. Uh, hey, Joe, do you have a favorite logo there from from what you can see on the screen? <laughs> uh, You're next, Lou. Yes. <laughs> but well, I'm going to say, 
Yeah, I know it loses too. <laughs> yep, you know what it is. I'm gonna go with Blood Mountain Clans because I can read that that's what it is. And oh, I, I meant don't to, want I, to reveal that I don't know the names of all the other ones. I meant to <laughs> remove that one from the from the choice just because I put it in there because yeah. I, I wrote that one and I was like, I love Blood Mountain Clans. Lou, what's your favorite one? Yeah. Um, obviously it's gonna be this amazing rainbow logo here. Um, my second favorite though is this one on the bottom right. Um what is that? Is that like Ergothoan or something? So when we when uh, when you look in the core rulebook, uh, you'll find with the sample starships that there are like these one sentence descriptions of a bunch of starship uh, manufacturers, and like that's all we've really said about a bunch of them. And the Shirin chapter mentions three different ones. There's uh, Starhive, and uh, let's see. Doo -doo -doo. Star have uh, unfortunately played one of them, but uh, what you're oh oh Hyvonics, yes, thank you kindly. And the one that you're looking at right now is United Interfaith Engineering, which in the core rulebook was just name dropped. I don't think they said anything about it. Um, but yeah, so United Interfaith Engineering is uh, basically a whole bunch of Sharon who don't really take the stance of we're going to go super peace. They're not the Sharons who say let us arm ourselves to the teeth because the swarm will be here any day, but rather they are sort of this unity. Uh, manufacturer that's spread out and recruited very widely. Um, and their manufacturer perk is all about exploration. So it can be up, they're meant to be like smaller crew ships that you could take in with a small group and just fly out to the stars. So they require a smaller maximum or minimum crew than any other starship. Fascinating. And, and so we've got Blood Mountain clans in the top left there. That's on Vesk Prime. They're like the oldest starship manufacturer. There's a little bit in near space about the Blood Mountains and the clans that joined together to form this company, which is, I thought was kind of fun. Um, and then we have Death's Head is in the top middle uh, from EOX. That's your... Yeah. Go ahead. And, and, and that, that was a particularly difficult assignment when I sent it out. Be, uh, because for a lot of these manufacturers from a similar like family, I gave them all to the same author. And when we looked at the Eoxian ones, um, uh, where you have like Black Wind, you have Death's Head, and uh, I'm going to remember the other one in just a oh, uh, Thumbtack. Um, all three of them are like, we are big and spoopy. We are made of bones. Mer. Some of us have red bits. Um, <laughs> And the assignment was really tough for uh, Alexi Greer, who uh, handled these, but, uh, but they did an amazing job of taking these three and differentiating them in really fun ways that I'm excited for people to read about. Nice. And just to round out, we have the Kevalari Collective on the top right. They're from Castrovel. The rainbow on the bottom left is Redshift Revolution, based on uh, Verses and then not the Planet Express logo in the middle bottom, <laughs> Jason Keeley in our chat, but uh, yeah, that really. is Sanjival Space Flight <laughs> Systems um, from Akaton. Um, and then, of course, like we said, uh, United Interfaith Engineering. So those are just six of the... I, I, was really, I was really excited when John was talking about ordering logos for these different manufacturers and everything and seeing what the artists came back with and everything. That was a lot of fun because that's actually one of the kind of the fun things on Starfinder, I think, is being able to take sort of modern things like in Pathfinder, we would never do a logo for a, for a corporation, you know, that's just not, but we could totally do it here. So yeah. that's one of those fun things. All right, let's go to the next slide and take a look at one of the ships that is in here. All right. This is the Starhive Vespiar, I believe. Who wants to say something about that? First of all, it's beautiful. I will say that. That is all. <laughs> awesome. This is um... yeah, so a bunch. Yeah, go. A, a bunch of our um, Sheeran based starships were done by Kate Baker. Uh, this is, I believe, this is also uh, one of hers. And the Vesp one of the cool things about the Vespiar, uh, in addition to it having a very bug like appearance, like a lot of our uh, Sheeran ships, is that. It has a gun where its stinger would be, and it has a lot of cool history because um, apparently some really early versions of it basically put the coolest cannon right where the stinger would be, but the most recent versions, they've uh, gone to a very turret-based model, and they only have a little tiny giant cannon on the 
Singer anymore uh, as sort of an homage to the past uh, versions. And that's one of the things I really love about a bunch of these Starship write-ups is that they talk about ways that the same model has evolved over time. So just like we might look at different car models and say, how has the Civic changed over the decades? Not you can look at a lot like of these Starships. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you can look at a lot of these and say, oh, this is, this is how it's changed and this is how it reached the point that we're seeing it today. And this is a battleship too, I think. So this is like on the bigger side of the scale of the Sheeran ships. So you have to imagine that even bigger than, than, you, would, normally, than you would normally think of. Um, we have a ton. This is the only ship that we have art for in this book, but we have a ton of other brand new ships of of all tiers. Um, trying to see what I, see. I would like to hear some themes that are in there. Like I know some of the some of the themes that are obviously they're sharing ships. Uh, what what else can people expect from the forty plus? Yeah, so we have. We basically have uh, some representative ships from a bunch of our different manufacturers and some that are a little bit uh, more off the beaten path. One of the themes that you'll find is racing. Um, we haven't really explored racing quite as much in, in Starship Combat, in part because you have a very set speed. Um, pardon me. But we have several of our manufacturers, especially Versite manufacturers, that are based on this idea of, yes, we are going to be as fast as possible. And it really gives sort of a speed racer vibe of what are the underground, figuratively speaking, racing circuits of, uh, of Starship uh, driving. And so uh, you'll find a couple of low tier like fighter craft or interceptor craft that are built to be as fast as uh, humanly, alienly possible, uh, which would be really <laughs> fun. I know. Well, I you got to let me jump in at this point. Jump in. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, no, I was gonna, I was gonna transition to uh, starship chases, which is where in this book. But no, you go ahead, Rob. <laughs> I was just gonna say that I was. That is a that is a good thing. It's. I, I was also looking with John. We were trying to determine what um, this this book went through several different iterations of what it was going to be, and. I wanted to cram as many starships as possible into it. Of course, we need to have other stuff, but I also wanted to kind of make things sort of even out. Like, I don't remember if, I, I think we already had a Pact Worlds battleship, but we didn't have a, a Vescarium battleship. And it's like, well, they really should both have battleships. So part of it was trying to kind of fill in tiers or ship types that particular groups didn't have in the game already that they, that they would. So we're kind of trying to like even out. I think we have something of just about every tier in there. Isn't that right, Joe? John? <laughs> yeah. We, we have two for every Starship tier except one-fourth. So we start at one-third and we go all the way to 20. Yeah, sweet. And then you can chase in them, right, Joe? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that segue. <laughs> I tried to cram this in. We have so much to talk about. It's so great. Um, but we have a whole section on Starship chases uh, where the GMs, where, where things are a little more abstracted out. Um, because sometimes you're just trying to escape from an enemy or chase them down in space in your cool in your cool ship, uh, and the GM gets to throw obstacles at the players, and they also get to the players get to pull off uh, sort of chase themed maneuvers, right? Like jettisoning stuff or uh, even casting a spell or causing electromagnetic interference. And going back to one of the things John was talking about, there there's something for every starship role to do in these chases, right? So whether you're a chief mate or an engineer or a magic officer, you're going to have some way you can contribute to the starship chase in, a, in an interesting and compelling way. Um, and then I, <laughs> I have awkward seg segues to the other thing I wanted to say I'm excited about for this book, but I'll, I'll, I'll defer it. back to you, Rob. Do it. <laughs> okay, great. I'll, I'll right, people, way away. Were talking about, <laughs> people were talking about the uh, Eoxian ships, like where do all those bones come from? And some people I saw suggested, you know, starship scale creatures. Well, there is a new system for making starship scale creatures in this book, uh, which is super quick. Um, so you don't have to build an entire starship and decide like what expansion base does my space. And look, from the beginning, people have been wanting to shoot at space dragons. So fine, you can make space dragons now uh, really quickly with the system and shoot at them all day long with your starship. Uh, but it also it just provides a, a really cool system for quickly generating uh, very thematic starship creatures that have you know basic stats for the mechanical side and then some interesting flavor tweaks 
uh, for various creature types and special abilities, things like that. And we also provided a couple, uh, sorry, a couple sample Starship creatures using that system, which I don't know if anyone else on the panel wants to talk about, but I, I got to say the things, the other things I'm excited about, so I'm good to, to be quiet for now. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, do you have anything to add about the Starship scale creatures? I sure don't. Oh. Okay. I also want to say with the, uh, with the chases, um, as part of those rules, we also have some rules about flying your starships in atmosphere as well um, to get into dogfights and that kind of stuff. So that's where we're also, we've also kind of expanded the places where you can go and, and play around with your starships too. Is there anything you want to say about that aspect too, John? I mean, uh, doing stuff with starships and atmosphere has long been uh, something that I and, and also uh, Thurston Hellman, who works on Starfinder Society, have been wanting to play I around see. with. Um, and that's that's partly been a difficult because we've always worked off of this idea that the size of a hex in starship combat is ambiguous, kind of purposefully, uh, just so that you're not saying exactly how fast is a starship, but more relatively how fast is this starship. Um, one of the things that the Starship Operations Manual does is it includes a section of guidance about how to uh, provide a temporary scale for hexes to perform certain types or fields of Starship combat. So if you want to kind of just say, okay, get, let's get a ballpark of how large is this hex for this encounter, that's fine. Or if you want to go down into like a canyon, you know, like... We keep on having uh, Starship-based movies or Starfighter-style movies where they like go into some sort of narrow corridor and they're weaving around and one of them hits the wall and goes flying or something like that. How can we make that happen? And uh, partly the answer is, let's take it down into the planet, into the atmosphere. Let's pilot Starships down the Adayo Rift of Akaton, for example. And so we have some guidelines for making that happen without locking us into saying that a hex is always this size. But rather, if you want this feel, here's how large you might make a hex and how we can then overlay that hex grid on a map and provide all this cool canyon and, and, um, and mountain context that you have to pilot. Around. So I think that's a really cool edge. And another cool thing is the notion of uh, the transition from space to atmosphere, where we have this um, short section about how to do orbital drops as well where you say, I just want to dive for my starship, or my starship blew up and now I have to dive to the surface. How do? Can I survive? Will I burn up? The answer is maybe. Um, but there are tools to help that turn into probably not. Uh, so I think that's a really cool system too. Sweet. All right, I think we're going to move on. And I probably should have said this at the beginning of the panel too, but we will have a question and answer session. So if we didn't pull out one of your questions that went by in the chat at the end here, we will also be looking for questions. So hold your questions on this or or anything else that you have or say them fat. And again, if you've joined late, we have an announcement, a special announcement we're going to make at the end of this panel. Um, so that's going to finish up our, at least our initial discussion on the Starship Operations Manual. Um, that is comes out next, um, I guess it's July, it's probably August. This was a Gen Con release. There's not a Gen Con, unfortunately, this year, but it should be out at the beginning of, of August. And that's going to take us to our next big hardback book, um, which comes out in the <gasps> fall. And that is Alien Archive 4. So let's go to the next slide, take a look at some of the monsters that, and it looks like we just lost John for a moment, but he will try to rejoin us as he can. He's back. Okay. It's just that uh, exciting. <laughs> that's right. He had to leave for a second. But he is back. So here we have, uh, I'm not sure if it's up on the screen, but this is an Elucid Daemon. Who, who knows most about this monster? <laughs> That's probably going to be me. First of all, so how did this, you say the, that again? <laughs> the Elucidamen. Um, A-L-U-C-I-B-I-D-A-E-M-O-N, I think. Um, so this is, uh, this is a creation of Thurston Hillman. Um, the Elucidamen is, well, every one of our daemons has some form of form of death that it espouses or means of death vector, I guess. Um, so, you know, we have classics where it's like death by drowning, death by f just raw fear, death by I I'm made of blades. Um, but when we look at Starfinder, 
oftentimes we're looking at how we can bring in that science fantasy uh, form and, and theme. And the Elucidamon is really doing that. The Elucidamon and its uh, spin-off, a larger version of it called the Elorbidamon, um, they are about death by being drawn too far into like virtual reality and uh, video game entertainment to the point that you die within or because of the game. So uh, I remember, for example, uh, being really charmed by the Baldur's Gate 2 loading screens, which would say, even though your characters don't have to eat, you do. Please get a snack. We don't want to lose any dedicated fans. The elucidamen is the thing that is waiting for you to forget to eat or for you to get so drawn into your VR stuff and get so shocked by the experience that you, in fact, die in your chair. So you see that it is wearing VR goggles, it has VR gloves, and it can basically float around in these little pods and it can overload your electronics or draw you into parts of your electronics to cause damage to you. Does this Damon have wow. a favorite console? <laughs> Ooh, I mean, we should really see about uh, Let's not establishing more of our vid game names <laughs> and some of our console creators. Because uh, right now, I don't think we do, but it would be really cool to do the same thing that we did for Starship Manufacturers and, Sa and Starship Operations Manual, but for these. For all gaming, all gaming consoles? <laughs> yeah, we can't all play Kick Punch. That's true. That's true. Is that the... Uh... Is Kick Punch the the uh, the, the the little Can't video game? That, uh... <laughs> Anyways, it's let's go to the next slide, slide. <laughs> <laughs> and see what our next monster is. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce half of it. Who wants to pr pronounce this one? <laughs> I think the, the author could give it a shot. <laughs> is that is that an extangy? Yeah, yeah, so this is your it first is. time seeing this art, right? This, <laughs> this is my first time seeing this art, y'all. This is the first for everybody here. Um, wow, <laughs> it's very cute. Um, yeah, so the Extangi are a playable race that I wrote. Um, they are lizard-like people who uh, have a cased system on their planet. Dev, you probably remember more on this than I do. I turned this in a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's uh, <laughs> there's, there's gleam scales and uh, yeah. there's there's all sorts of stuff going on with these <laughs> that are pretty fascinating. In a good way, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they so they had they had something happen during the gap, and I, I like when entries talk, you know, incorporate the gap into species uh, histories and current events, even uh, and. All these Exangis know is that before the gap, they were fighting off this planet-threatening blight. Uh, I think it's called like the Blackened Bark or something like that. Uh, and that, that was, yeah, <laughs> that was, I mean, these things change in dev anyway, right? But, and this was something that came about probably as a result of them taxing their environment too much. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but then something happened. <laughs> I don't want to the spoil gap too much. Happened. Yeah, that's another thing. Like, I don't want to spoil too much. But knowing me, but, but, being the writer, this is definitely like a political thing. <laughs> well, sure. And they, the, the interesting thing I think about them is they came out of the gap and suddenly they're fine and living affluent lives on these like floating islands above <laughs> the canopy of their worlds. Uh, so, and they don't know how it happened because it happened in the gap. So going into the gap, they're like, oh, we're all going to die. This is terrible. Uh, but coming out, they're like, hey, uh, we seem to be fine, question mark. And uh, <laughs> see, someone said the Fire Nation attack. So, uh, <laughs> That's this is what a good, it was. This is also a good example of, you know, <laughs> uh, a humanoid species that has a lot more going on to it than its two arms and two legs. Uh, something where we get to kind of take inspiration from Earth-like animals, but not just make it a chameleon with... Uh, with human arms, <laughs> right? So I think I think we did a good job uh, bringing these to life. And I'll, I'll leave the rest of the details, like the cast system and all that, for readers of the book. Joe, can you, for people that don't know, can you say a little bit about what our philosophy is with uh, playable races in our alien archives? Like what we what what we do and why we try to do it that way. Oh, we love we love playable species. It's just like. We, we have more than 100 uh, going into this book, and we're not stopping anytime soon. There's, 
uh, between nine and 12, I'd say, new playable species in, in Alien Archive 4 by itself. Um, and part of that is just we love the cantina feel. We say that all the time, but we, we love the idea that you and your Starship crew, I mean, all the fan art I see, right, of people getting commissions of their party, it's this wild cast of characters, like that, some of which don't have spines and some of which are, uh, don't have eyes. You know, there's just like, there's weird shapes and sizes uh, and colors, and it's just great uh, to see this. It, it captures this diversity that we also like to see in our player base. Um, but it, it, it just tells you, hey, you're in a really strange galaxy where basically anything can talk to you and have adventures, and you can be those <laughs> things as well. <laughs> and so, and it's also part of the broader philosophy of uh, providing books that both GMs and other players can use, right? So there's plenty of monster stats and templates and GM-facing uh, mechanics in Alien Archives, obviously, but there's also not just playable species, but lots of lots of player options, so feats and spells and augmentations and just basically anything you can name. There's a big, big old index in the back that guides you to all that stuff, and that's been true in all our previous Alien Archives, and it'll be true for this one as well, which is really exciting. Can I uh, mention something I just saw in chat? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pl platyparians when? <laughs> <laughs> Want to like platyparians? Are they in this book? That is a very not? good question. <laughs> <laughs> Who Great knows? Question. I just thought that was cute. I wanted to throw that up here. <laughs> it's been a long-demanded species. But they, they have it to is. be somewhere out there in the galaxy. It's the special mouse has right. to be platyparians. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Dang it, you called it. <laughs> Let's go to you know. the next slide and see if it's platyparians or not. It is not, but I'm going to make Joe pronounce what this monster is or this alien is. Whoa, what are we even looking at? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Let me work up my will to pronounce this name, which I have never done before. <laughs> I've only seen it in writing, <laughs> just how we do things around here. Yeah. Uh, actually, Jason Keeley's in like. chat, and he's the author. Maybe he has some thoughts. He can do a. This is a. <clears throat> Sasyanoid, so, of course. That's pretty good. Sasyanoid. Yeah. That sounds good to me. Uh, and I would love to give some background to this creature because, look, when you're trying to make a bunch of weird aliens, uh, sometimes there's a barrel, and sometimes you see the bottom of it. <laughs> um, but <laughs> in this case, uh, somebody sent me a picture of a pepper, a bell pepper sliced in half. And we said, you know what? We're making that into an alien. That looks like a cool alien face. And so <laughs> this creature is basically the result of how can we make, how can we take something really weird and make it into a playable species? Uh, and here you have the Sassanoids. Jason, all you have to do is ask Jason Keeley to make something super strange and he'll deliver uh, on all cylinders. So you can see this thing has, what, four legs and three arms, uh, some weird like rooster-like crest. Uh, and they're and not on top of that, they're not a joke, right? Like these are <laughs> these are a sapient species that have a rich <laughs> and deep culture. Uh, but please don't bully them. No, don't don't leave them alone. They're beautiful, and <laughs> and of course, like many of our uh, especially playable species, there's more art of these. There's another another full body shot uh, that we're not sharing with you because we're mean, uh, but it's just as cool. Uh, and these these creatures uh, discover that they have the power uh, thanks partially to their near space planet that they live on, uh, to sort of cultivate magical crystals. Um, they have this network of underground caverns, and, and they've even learned over time that, they can, that specific caverns will, will help them craft specific crystals. And so that's reflected in their flavor and also a little bit in their mechanics, uh, which is pretty cool. But yes, uh, Sasyanoids is what I'm going with for all future reference. It's pretty easy to pronounce. <laughs> Do you know what it's doing in that piece? Somebody on the chat's asking, what is it doing? And I couldn't tell that either when I was looking at it. Do you know? It's, it's uh, crafting a crystal, a spell gem, or maybe a Solarian we weapon crystal, which they can do in half the time. Um, and if they have an arcane laboratory, they can do it in a quarter of the time. They, they love them some crystals. That looks more like a spell gem than a Solarian weapon crystal to me, but yeah. And these are, and these are playable, you said, correct? Oh, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide and see another monster. Is it a giant dung beetle or something else? John, I think you know most about this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. This, this was a real treat to work on. 
Um, so these are the Corona Beetles, uh, written by Venetia Valetti. And uh, basically, Corona Beetles are, like, we have a whole bunch of weird environments for Starfinder. Like, sure, we have the jungle planets, and lo, there are deserts, and, and uh, tundra, and whatnot. But we can also live on stars, or some things can, like Corona Beetles. Corona Beetles basically uh, it live on the surface of suns, and they look for anything that is even remotely semi-solid, and they collect them in order to make these big chrysalises that they eventually uh, metamorphose inside of. But until they get a large enough amount, they have to roll them around basically like dung beetles on the surface of, uh, of, of suns and stars. Um, then they burrow in, they metamorphose, and they turn into sort of the, the uh, adult form that then burrows deep into the star and uh, goes through the whole reproduction cycle before a new set of these beetles comes out. But you know, if you're a beetle and you're on a star that doesn't just have enough scrap around, maybe you just need to find better ground. And one of the most charming things about these things is that they have this sense for finding solar flares. So when they don't find enough resources, they will wander over to a sunspot where they sense a solar flare is about to happen, and they will spread their wings. And when the solar flare happens, like a geyser, it will fling them into space. They will fly for however many years until they hit something else. Hopefully it's another star where they can live happily. Sometimes it will be your house on a planet. Um, so ostensibly you can end up with these things anywhere you want, even though they're made for stars. Um, and even more fun, there are some cultural aspects tied to Saren Ray that are absolutely precious about these things. So I really love everything about them, including the, the iridescence that we see in the art. That's beautiful. I have a question. Yeah. How big are these things? So most of them are medium or they get to large, which is just about the right size for, you know, a worshiper of Saren Ray to ride around on if they wanted. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, okay. Yeehaw! <laughs> All right. <laughs> <Root and tootin. laughs> Let's go to the next slide here. And see, I think this is another one, I think, John, that you know about. Yeah. So this is the Sapenga. And the Sapenga is uh, is a plant creature. You know, you might be surprised by some of like the limbs that it has, but you'll see that it's made out of all these wonderful uh precious petals. So it's basically this giant cross between a pangolin and a cactus. Um, but we have two different forms of the Sapenga here. So one of them is called a Sapenga pup, where this is the young form of Sapenga. They're kind of cute. They wander around. They'll plant themselves, or they wait for a, a strong wind, and then they will roll up and basically, um, uh, what's it called, tumbleweed to uh, better ground. But until they truly feel safe, they stay with their parent, like you see on the back of these uh, wonderful larger Sapenga titans. Um, those little flowers on the back, those are its babies. Um, and so a Sapenga titan will run around looking for prey until eventually it can stomp on it and, and eat what it wants, while all its little babies sort of pop off like little remoras and will start to eat as well. Um, so they look beautiful. Uh, the artist did a fantastic job with this thing. Um, and I'm just charmed by the whole life cycle and, and behavior of these creatures. Yeah, they look pretty For sweet. All and... succulent lovers out there. Yeah. So we, again, we tried to get like, you know, a, a, the mix of we got playable species, we got plants, we got vermin, we've got as many different things as, as we can in this, in this thing. But like every alien archive, of course, we have more than just new aliens and everything. We try to put in some sort of subsystem or, or rules bit in the back. Joe, can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about what's in the back of AA4? I would love to. Uh, this time we've gone with a species augmentation system. So this is something where you can sort of experiment with your species. You know, maybe you're a born human, but you think Barathu tentacles are really cool. Well, that's, uh, this is the science fantasy future, and you can get some installed. They were probably lab-grown, you know, maybe donated by somebody, but uh, the, the flavor is not too important there. <laughs> but what is important is that there are more than, I think, there's somewhere between 60 and 70 uh, new augmentations for various systems uh, that you can install that give you the, the racial traits of uh, other species. And in fact, those even those qualify you for prerequisites for things like uh, some of the feats and other uh, alternate racial features that we've, we've provided 
if you have, uh, I, of course, I'm struggling to think of an example because we're on stream, but <laughs> there are certain feats that have prerequisites. Uh, and if you have one of these uh, augmentations installed, then you qualify for that, that feat. Um, so for example, you could be a human that has a Marikois prehensile tail, or you might be an android with Strix wings. Uh, you could be a Vesk that can curl up like a Bolita and roll. Uh, or you could be a Kasatha that has uh, a Hans sort of spider silk balloon that pops out of their back and lets them gently float <laughs> around. Uh, and those are not, those are specific examples because those are things we've asked for art for. So I'm hoping to see those things in this book. Uh, but I'm also hoping to see what people come up with. Uh, with these wild augmentations, because there's nothing stopping you from getting more than one. Uh, there are many systems that you, <clears throat> excuse me, you can install these augmentations into. Uh, this is another Jason Keeley joint. So I mean, I'm excited to see what people do with this system, and especially like the fan art that people make of these things uh, is especially exciting to me. I, I'm really excited for the Kasatha that decides to bolt on another set of arms so that they can oh, better understand gosh. the traditions of skittermanders. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because you'll idea. have this tall, looming creature who's just like, I am helping uh, <laughs> as they wander around. We had somebody in the chat asking if a contemplative can buy a beefy body to go with their big brain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that one of the options mm. available? Be beefy body is not a racial trait that exists currently in the game. Uh, good point. Uh, certainly one that we can <laughs> think about. <laughs> I don't know. What would be a good... Uh, I mean, if, if you're not a contemplative, you can grab the applied knowledge graft and get the contemplatives sort of boost to your brain. Uh, which Does it actually you... make brain big? I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, in my canon, yes. What's cool about augmentations is you can apply whatever flavor you want. And in fact, you know, we already have species that share some racial traits. So you can decide, for example, when you take a prehensile tail, whether you're taking a Maracoy's prehensile tail or one of the new species in this book that has prehensile tail, which I won't spoil, uh, or, you know, something of your own design. Uh, but there's there's lots of cool. I'm just looking like you can take the Corlu's uh, lithic graft, which lets you <laughs> reinforce your heart and lungs with silicon plates and nets that makes you immune to disease, disease and poison. Cool stuff like that. That sounds safe. Yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> So on the topic of aliens and, and monsters, um, we don't have to limit this to only Alien Archive 5, but um, let's see, like, is it... Wait, wait, wait. Did you just what? announce Alien Archive 5? Did I say 5? 4. Yeah. I did not announce Alien Archive 5 because there is not... Anyway, so does not have to be... It could be something... Somebody, somebody was uh, on the chat was saying uh, beefy body in AA5, so that's why I was... The hashtag, that's why I was in my head. <laughs> We are not restricted to Alien Archive 4 right now. I want to I see what sort of favorite alien uh, from Starfinder do you have? Lou, do you have a favorite? A favorite alien? From Starfinder, yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, it's tough. You know, okay. This One is of your favorites. This is the first thing that popped into my head, but I'm, I'm very uh, partial to Barathus because of my... <laughs> who is a, a meathead Barathu soldier. Um, so yeah, kind of love them. Nice, close Barathu. To my heart. Cool. I thought you were going to say something else, but that is interesting. What? Okay. I well, thought you were going to say one of the ones that you, that you wrote, you know, like the Osharu oh. or, the, or the Belita or something like that. <laughs> oh, do I come off? Is that kind of... <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's what I do. I, actually, I just um... pick things that I worked on. <laughs> I am quite proud of uh, the Osharu, actually. Joe, how about you? Do you have a favorite? I, I, yeah, that gave me time to think of something. Thank you for that <laughs> exchange. Um, my, I, I actually really like the Spectra, which are a new outsider species that we've introduced attached to the Drift, uh, which is, of course, the hyperspace, faster-than-light dimension that can be accessed only by technology. And so uh, we got to create basically the devils and angels of the drift and they are spectra they're they're the outsider uh that comes with the drift and we get to do a lot of cool things with them we've we introduced them in alien archive 3 but there's uh mm, 
I'm not sure if it's known that there will be one in another product coming up, but then there are also two more in this book, in Alien Archive 4. So it's, it's really fun to have created that and then be building on it uh, as we go and making it something very Starfinder, uh, but that still has roots in, you know, these games' histories where the, there are outsiders that influence uh, PC's adventures. Cool. We've also got a bunch of people in the in the chat here posting their favorite mon fa favorite alien. So by all means, keep doing that because those are fun to read. But John, what about what about your favorite aliens? Um. So one of the things that I found that I really really enjoy when working on doing some of the Alien Archive Four creatures is that I really love animals, magical beasts, and plants, the sort of things where you might look at them and say, oh, this is very mundane, but then you can create all this cool ecology and behavior and stuff, and even some cool abilities that totally surprise and blindside the, uh, the, the PCs that, um, that are really charming to me. And uh, so certainly close to my heart is the Kasarik, which is the uh, tentacle-faced plant creature that we have in Alien Archive 1. That was um, one of the first things we created for Starfinders, Aliens go, and I was able to create it. And I've been always really excited to see it showing up in our art and as a as one of our staple creatures. Um, but I also really love Ishtikri, the stone-faced squid, which is just a phrase that charmed me ever since I first saw it in the core rulebook and said, "Oh my gosh, I want to know more about those." Um, and now we do. That is true. See, I'm going to go. Well, I and I I think that. I like one that hasn't actually appeared in the Alien Archive, but it was in Pact World as a playable race, and that is the Bantrids. I just love Bantrids rolling all around, constantly in motion. Um, and I was really excited to when they were getting a role in uh, the Devastation Arc Adventure Path. So if you haven't checked that out and you like Bantrids, you should look into the Devastation Arc AP. Get to well, look. and and you've even tied into Bantrids and uh, some of the stuff that Joe was talking about with being able to swap in different pieces uh there is a small following of the swoltrid which is the bantrid that has two bionic arms stapled to its sides <laughs> they can just can have the swole body augmentation that lou was so excited about indeed <laughs> okay let's um I think we've kind of talked about monsters for quite a bit. So let's move to another new book that we haven't really talked about at all. And perhaps, Joe, you could tell us about it. Let's go to the next slide, too. Yeah, I'm foaming at the mouth for this one. So a, a question that we get fairly regularly, including earlier this morning in my Ask Me Anything channel in the Discord for PaizoCon Online, is are we going to get a Starfinder GM guide of some kind? Uh, another question that I get asked a lot personally is, what what do you want to see in Starfinder uh, that isn't there yet? Um, and then a question I ask myself with all of our hardcover products is, how can we make make sure that this is for GMs and other players as well? Like, how can we make this as universally appealing? That's something the whole team we're always looking to do, obviously, so that people will buy our books and have fun with them uh, as many as possible. Um, so this book is kind of the answer to all these questions, uh, and it's part game mastery guide, right? There are tables, I will say. There are many tables in this book, um, but it's also packed with player options. So uh, there are there are new options for every class in Starfinder, including the three from Com, uh, from Character Operations Manual. There's new equipment, uh, and then what's really special to me about this book is. Uh, a, a system for creating so sorry the gist of this book is the galaxy it's called the galaxy exploration manual and it helps you explore the galaxy which is something uh that is not necessarily been lacking in starfinder but is definitely a key trope of we're in a starship and we're we're setting off into the inky black to find see what we can find uh and now we, we're giving you a whole hardcover on how to do that um uh with your group uh and especially gms i think will find this useful not just for exploring, there, there's an entire chapter on how to run sort of sandbox open-ended adventures and campaigns and even make your own settings. Um, but there's also a, a robust world building system. So it's no secret, people that have heard me talk anywhere probably have heard me talk about the Deck of Many Worlds, which is a Starfinder accessory product that's already out. That is a bunch of cards that lets you generate random worlds. Um, and there's, it's sort of an idea prompter. Uh, this 
this book uh, sort of takes that to the next level and says, okay, you know that your world is, or you want it to be a high technology world with uh, maybe you know a forest biome and some underwater stuff going on. Well, now you have entire sections of the of this book that will that will tell you flavor um, that you can that both GMs and players can read about. It'll tell you uh, it'll give you some new player options that are thematically tied to that, but you know physical attribute like a biome or a cultural attribute like magic or technology or religion or even alignment. Um, so you just have all these levers you can pull to bring together worlds just out of out of nothing, basically. Um, and of course, tables to generate those worlds. Lots of tables. <laughs> uh, there's a treasure table that I've that I've developed that I'm in love with. Uh, uh, it's just got a lot of interesting alternate treasure for 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 uh, GMs to give out, and it, each one of them is basically an adventure hook on its own. So I could see PCs not selling it, unfortunately. <laughs> shorting themselves uh but uh yeah i mean i could talk about this book forever but <laughs> i only have a few minutes here before we get into q a so uh is, is there anything my fellow panelists feel that i have missed in in gushing should, about this for a few minutes i should point out this is a mock-up cover um we're actually we're we're still working on this book so this is not what the final cover will look like um you may even recognize that piece of art from somewhere else. And this is where this is scheduled to come out at the beginning of 2021. So this is next year in in the spring. Um, so we're not going to go too much into it because, like I said, we're still we're still working on it. But it is I think it's going to be really cool. There's I, I think we're, we were all really excited about it as we, as we slowly started putting it together and trying to cram as much stuff as we could into it because it's a whole galaxy's worth of worth of stuff to go in there. Uh, yeah, something. Those are excellent points. And something I found really exciting and encouraging was a lot of the freelancers that I sent this outline, the book, the outline for this book to, came back with sometimes all caps like "This book looks amazing." Like, <laughs> not just their contribution, but we've we've gotten a lot of really good, um, a lot of good writers in on this book, and I'm excited to to sh share with everyone what they've come up with. It's it's really exciting. So, please look forward to it. Anything uh, that you all want to add, John or Lou, about the Galaxy Exploration Manual? I think Joe covered uh, it pretty the, well. Uh, the Galaxy Exploration Manual is really fun to me because in exploring a bunch of these environments and biomes, um, we're also looking at what does it mean for one of these biomes to be an alien biome. We can make swamps that look like Earth swamps all we like, but what does a what does a really weird swamp look like? What is the range of what could qualify as a wetland? And how can you just uh, make it even weirder and more bizarre? Uh, so that your uh, players and your characters are staring a dog in awe as they land and explore this place. Sweet. Um, okay, well, let's go and do some question and answers now. Just type a question in the... Uh... In the chat, if you put like at official Paizo, it helps us see it a little bit. Although I may not be logged in, so it may not matter for that. But it doesn't it can be about anything? Um, if it's if it's any if it's related to any of the books we talked about, that's obviously better. Um, we have a question here by Larry Seven by Three. What about alternative combat rules? Are the rumors right? I'm not even sure what that's. There is a little bit about. We have another question from Night Trace about single seat fighters and starship operations. Um, John, would you want to you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I believe these are both speaking to the uh, same point. There's there's been some hinting in both the product page of Starship Operations Manual and just a little bit uh, to the side of there being different ways of running starship combat. And this is less about like what are the are you like overhauling the rules or anything? It's not like that. Rather, it's ways of telling different uh, forms of starship combat that are on a different scale or a different division. Because the base starship combat is all about saying, we're all in the same starship. Let's fly around together. We have one pilot. We have one captain, that sort of thing. But what if you were instead doing sort of an X-wing trope, or we're all in different little starfighters, and we are part of a squadron? Um, starship Operations Manual does have rules for running squadron combat. Mostly... It works like existing Starship combat, where you still have your uh, 
pr primary crew actions and you have your minor actions as you like. You still have the different roles and you might have to swap between them, even though you are always in the same seat, uh, where you just briefly say, I need to pilot with my feet, but I need to be a science officer right now. Um, but you have that option to all be in different starships. But there are these supplemental systems and expansion bays and things like that that smooth out how starship combat works. So what if we want to fly in formation? What if we really just want to follow the leader and let one of us do the main piloting while the rest of us are like, yes, sir, or whatever you say, sir. Um, what if we want to do attack runs with all of us swooping in the same uh, way and shooting in the same spot? How can we make that happen? Or in one case, and uh, this was a cool addition by, uh, by the section's author, uh, Alex Agunas, there is a rule set for Voltroning your starships together in case you want to turn your X-Wings into one giant Voltron creation for a while and then split off again. Uh, so there's a lot of dynamic action going on in it that's really cool. The other side of it is that maybe instead of going smaller, you want to go bigger. And... Uh, what can be bigger than running the entire armada yourself? So instead of being the captain, instead of being a science officer or an engineer, what if you were the admiral? You were the chief engineer for the entire armada. What if you were a commander of an entire squadron? That sort of thing. So PCs are those high-end officers, and it's basically a mass combat-like system for running entire armadas against armadas uh, all at once, where each one of the little uh, tokens that you're putting down on the board represents maybe a dozen, maybe a hundred starships. Uh, and so the size and the caliber and the design of the starships that make those up determine the statistics. And so you as players can split up control over those units and fleets in a really cool way as you are also officers using your own turns to augment your fleets and issue commands. It's a really cool system. Sweet. Uh, one question we have here, which is about, someone was asking if we can talk about the upcoming adventure path for the Starfinder RPG. Um, there is an R there is an adventure path or adventures uh, panel tomorrow. It's both Pathfinder and Starfinder. Um, so they're going to be talking all about um, all about those tomorrow. So we won't talk about that here because the AP team is is going to be on that panel. So definitely pay it, look for that uh, tomorrow. You can look at the Twitch schedule on, on our blog at paizo.com. Um, another question we had earlier that I'm going to send to you, Joe, is does Alien Archive 4 have class graphs from the character operations manual? It sure does. The end. Yes. yes. The end. Made sure to put that on there. <laughs> That's a big yes. Cool. That was a, uh, this was an also an interesting thing. It says, what that you can talk about has you most excited about these upcoming books? Um, does somebody want to <laughs> jump on this one first or? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I mean, gem, gem is there. excitement, right? The Galaxy <laughs> Exploration Manual. I'll just say it one more time for the, the people in the back. The gem is excitement. Yes. Boom. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lou, is there anything, Lou, is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to in one of these upcoming books? Hmm. I, can't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, honestly. Just in general, I'm very excited about all Starfinder products. Cool. How about you, John? Uh, one of the things that we didn't touch upon in Starship Operations Manual is that there are uh, some GM-facing sections as well. Uh, namely, that these are exploring what it means to run a Starship encounter or a Starship campaign in a bigger sense than just putting figures down on a hex grid and shouting pew pew at each other until one of you blows up, which is exciting. Don't get me, uh, don't, don't take me wrong. But uh, how can you build an entire campaign arc in which you are using Starship combat regularly as a core element of the narrative? So if you want to do your professional racing circuit campaign, we have uh, an entry in there that gives you all of the major story beats for various levels of play that could tell basically the equivalent of an adventure path, but you are playing Speed Racer, for example. Um, or if you want to be playing Space Pirates or, um, or a little bit of fly for your die sort of flavor even. Um, it's all about giving GMs the tools to recognize how can I turn Starship Combat into more than just a subsystem, but to make it into an important part of my story and my game experience. Cool. For me, I'm definitely looking forward to the Starship Operations Manual. 
I'm looking forward to all of the new starships and particularly their art and the pawns of them because starships just look cool and I really like them. And I'm hoping that with some of this really cool art that at some point we can eventually get minis of them. Um, that would be super cool. So I'm interested in, in seeing what, what people think about that. And I mean, everything we come out with, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about as well. Um, John, I'm going to kick this one back to you because I thought this was another good question, which is with the Starship manufacturers, are there rules to create your own manufacturers or potentially just extrapolating from the ones presented? Would that, would, are you able to do that? Yeah, I mean, the rules for the Starship manufacturers are very simple. Like they're very short perks at the very end of really awesome history and background. So you'll find that a lot of the perks are like a range of two to four lines each. Um, so I think that you'll have little trouble identifying some cool design space to create your own. Um, the, the core idea when we were creating them and balancing them was let's make sure that this has roughly like, you know, one to three build points worth of difference in how you design your starship. And ideally it's not about how well you shoot or, or the like, but more about how you deal with some of the auxiliary systems in your starship in a cool way. We had another question. Will all player books now be called the XY manual? Probably not. I think I think this with this this one being the third one, uh, I may have uh, used up all of my XY manual <laughs> constructions. I know our our art our main art director Sarah keeps like that's getting too long. It's not going to fit on the spine. And <laughs> you're looking at the number of characters, so <laughs> we might end up uh, this this might be the last of the XY manual. Um, we'll just have to see. Let me see if there's another good question here. Um, well, here's something. What in the book required the most development or was most difficult to get right? And since this question did not specify the book, I'm going to make it be any or all of the books that we've talked about. So, Joe, let's let's hear what you think in terms of, I know you haven't really done a deep dive into Jim yet. Is there anything that, or even, you know, on Psalm or AA4 or anything, what required the yeah, most? Yeah, I think I can answer for, for all of our books. Because one thing, if I name anything in, in particular, I'm going to make a freelancer feel real bad. And that might be one of you, or it might be me, or it might be <laughs> someone out there. Uh, and it's really not about, quality of writing. We have so many great uh, writers. I think the hardest thing to do in any of these projects, and including these three books in particular, and I would say especially with uh, the Galaxy Exploration Manual, is a sort of consistency of tone, right? Like of saying, what is Starfinder? What does it sound like? What does it look like? What's true in the, in the universe? And that's, that's not just mechanics. That's obviously, you know, Rob, you know a ton about this as creative director. We, we have to make sure that we are telling a consistent story so that people can take, pick it up and run with it. Uh, so I would say the hardest thing to develop is often everything <laughs> because, uh, and, and not only, it's not just one person working on these things, it's, it's, mul it's all of us uh, at times. Um, I think John and I managed to handle Alien Archive 4 by ourselves, which I think is the first time an Alien Archive has been developed by fewer than, or by two people or, wait, what, how do I say numbers? Anyway, by Ooh. just a couple people, uh, which, which was great. Because again, it helps us keep that sort of consistent tone and uh, put out put out a product that feels like a book, um, which sometimes it's 30, 30 plus authors that have contributed, right? And so, uh, and everyone has awesome things to contribute and sort of maintaining that voice, uh, that individuality, while also presenting something that is that uh, feels like Starfinder. Lou, from the editing side, is there is there something that that you run into a lot that's that's challenging with Starfinder books or, or even with writing? You know what? what... I find myself looking up um, physics questions. A lot. Is the, is this an answer to your question? Like this is the thing that I struggle with when um, editing Starfinder is like knowing how things work. Because I'm not a very scientific... Oh, that sounds wrong. Okay, let's say, say this in another way. I'm an artistic person, a, a visually artistic person. So I'm constantly looking up how things work. <laughs> is, that's that's is that valid. I do the that... same thing in like <laughs> development and writing, too. It's like, okay, I need to quickly educate myself on... <laughs> 
like uh, yes. the other Go ahead. the other day i uh had to look up how uh heat disperses in space so i you know what i learned something mm-hmm. new all the time working on starfire it's yeah, that's one of the uh, one of the fun things we get to do is investigate the science when we have time and ability and make it as sort of realistic as possible. And then when it doesn't work for our cool stories, we just throw it right on out the window and say magic and advanced technology. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it, it's the other thing is, of course, I, I think Jason Tondra likes to point this out all the time that if you try to exactly accurately capture the science, you'll be wrong within a few years <laughs> anyway. So uh, I think. I think it's a lot of fun to learn a lot about uh, just the science and technology that we have access to right now as humans, and then also play with the borders of that and, and push beyond it, because it's science fantasy, and we get to do what we want. We had that actually in, in near space, where we finally you know, we, we took a look at the Vescarium, and we, gave a, we did a map, of, an illustrated map of the Vescarium solar system with the blue sun. And I was like, I wanted to do something interesting with the with the sun there. And so I was looking it up. And of course, nobody has ever actually been to a blue sun before. But there was some stuff that was saying, it's like, well, it probably wouldn't be habitable. And so I remember like asking the team, I'm like, so science probably says you couldn't live around a blue sun, but we can kind of get around with it. With, and everyone's like, yeah. And so in, that's it. for science fantasy, it's blue suns are actual have habitable planets outside them. So that was a that exact same kind of thing that Joe was just talking about. John, was there something challenging or, or from any of the books you've worked on recently in particular that you want to talk about as well? I mean, just as a general rule, anything that is a standalone subsystem is going to be really challenging because it has to stand on its own in a, in a way. Like if I create a feat, a feat is already, we already have a system for feats. We already know how feats work and roughly how powerful they should be. But when we're creating something largely from scratch, or that's going to be the basis for an entire style of encounter, there's always more pressure to make sure that it works out in a clean way. And that is a way that people can pick up and run with fairly quickly. So that you're not spending you know, several hours at the table with everybody researching how to run this encounter, but rather that you can do a five minute review and sort of jump into it. So subsystems are just, tricky in that regard because they're having to thread that needle and there's so much that could go wrong that you want to make sure that it's all the more perfect. We have uh, another question here. Any plans for an Armory 2 or about getting more equipment in other books? Um, I can't answer that specifically, although we did uh, look, we did, we did talk about this kind of stuff and we wanted to do more than just an armory too. Um, it's a little bit too early to talk about those kind of things yet. So keep your eyes on the future for something possibly related. Um, another question. I, I, I can jump in there. Oh, go for it. Oh yeah. Um, just in terms of Alien Archive 4, we'll have more equipment that's thematically tied to the aliens that in whose entry they appear. I think I nailed the grammar of that if we want to celebrate that in chat. Um, and then also the Galaxy Exploration Manual, as I mentioned, will have not just new equipment, but, but include new equipment that is, again, thematically tied, but can be used sort of anywhere uh, that a player wants to use it. We generally try to put in in our hardbacks a little some some equipment, and because you know the tech stuff is is fun. Going back to the Starship Operations Manual, we say we have a question: Is there a cost to having a specific manufacturer, like there is for weapon manufacturers? John, could you address that one? There's not necessarily a cost to it. It's basically um, a way of tying your starship and your place in uh, the setting more into the world. So. Rather than saying, I am creating a completely customized thing, um, and you know it's very pers- uh, personalized, which is awesome, but what if we were just to go to the manufacturers directly and get something right off the line? Um, how, can, how does that go? And also, what, what's the benefit of that? Um, so manufacturers are just sort of a way to say, Here, here's how I, as a GM, can sort of entice you into engaging with more parts of our setting. Okay, I think here's a, I'm still kind of scrolling back through the chat. Um, so it's another- Here's a question, question I'd love to answer if I can steal one. 
Sure. Sorry, rather interrupting you. <laughs> it's because you, you, you won't be surprised that it's a question about the deck of many worlds, and that's why I'm like trying oh, to. Oh, I was going to get that one to you next, but take it now. You brought it up before. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, go. Dancing in my chair like a bantry. Um, so, <laughs> so people have asked about expanding the deck of many worlds, uh, which I would love to do someday. So, you know, if, if the deck continues to do well, then, you know, maybe that increases the chances. Who knows? But I wanted to say that the Galaxy Exploration Manual was super informed by the deck, which I was heavily involved in both. Uh, and I definitely, you know, when you use the deck to create a world, it's giving you prompts about the alignment and the technology and the levels of magic and religion and how well the, the world gets along within itself and within its system. Uh, and all of those are like directly translatable to the Galaxy Exploration Manual. So, and the Galaxy Exploration Manual doesn't require the deck by any stretch. Um, you can use what's in the book to create randomized worlds that have all these attributes. But if you have the deck, then you can also just create worlds with the deck and then and then super expand on them using what's in the book. So I'm super excited about that sort of connectivity that's not required, but but definitely adds to the experience. So thank you for your, the time. I, I return to my colleague from Washington State. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so this one was about squadron combat in the Starship Operations Manual. It says, are there any single or two-man crew ships in it that would be more appropriate for us to use in the ships we already have in other books? Um, I mean, we have we have a variety of different um, one and two operator starships, uh, and certainly this uh, the Starship Operation Manual introduces a fair number more of them, especially at lower tiers. So they're going to be the sort of things that you could pick up from the book and then say, "Oh, this is a little bit too low tier for what we need." That's fine. Add a couple more features. Make it tier four instead. Um, but the the smaller ones are also a way for us to explore uh, different traditions of starships, especially smaller ones. So we have, for example, a little bit of exploration of the Skyfire Legion. Um, so they have a two-person uh, starfighter sort of starship that is really built for a Rephorian and a Dragonkin. But you know, if you want to do it with your um, with your human and a Skittermander instead, that's totally cool. Or we have um, we have the Skyfisher, which is a Kevlari starfighter, which was really instrumental in the uh, war against the Vescarium and later the Swarm. And if you want to pick up one of those uh, from a junkyard from an older model or pick up one of the newest ones, you could totally grab that and run with it. And on top of that, you'll have art to go along with your new starships. Um, so more options, but you're just as able to build your own. Cool. We've got several questions here like, oh, is there a plan for this product? Is there a plan for this product? And there's so many things that it's like we can't announce everything and we haven't even, you know, we, ha we don't have everything planned out for, for years and years. Um, and it seems like, is there going to be a, a vast book? You know, it's, we don't have one officially planned yet, but you know, we did a near space and a packed world. So at some point we will probably do something to address the vast in some point uh, with things like spell cards They're They've been pretty, um, we have new ones just coming out for, for Pathfinder. So, you know, if those, if those, work well um we could very likely have those for for starfinder yet we're just not ready to announce them if there's any kind of product that that you want to see you know by feel free to go to the message boards the starfinder message boards and let that know you know if you get a thread started and other people are in there going we we do pay attention to those and we see what the fans want to see and you know if we can give that so by all means let us know let us know on the on on the message boards the the type of products that you want to see because we want to give you all what we want. Here's a good uh, galaxy exploration manual question. Um, will the galaxy exploration manual provide me information on how to create and run a home base, such as a planet, space station, space citadel, drift protection business? That's awesome. Uh, first. Second, there, there's nothing mechanically planned to do that. So no, not like a a point system or sort of like a king bakery type thing but there there is like i said a whole chapter uh that helps gms run create set do everything from creating entire settings right like starfinder is a setting you you can get advice on how to make your own setting your own campaign within your own setting or starfinder setting um adventures and, and all the way down to encounters and there will definitely be advice on how to how to not only to do that, but how to do it a little bit. Um, so I wouldn't expect like 
necessarily tables, which we love, <laughs> and, and uh, numbers attached to it, but there will be information. Yes. All right, here's something for all of us. Do you have any secrets for successfully hiding all of my Starfinder stuff from my wife before she finds out what all I bought? Lou, do you have any ideas for this one? <laughs> or anybody. <laughs> I would I mean, say I, a note in your yard. What's that, Lou? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'd say um, put it in a nice fancy box and just like bury it. I'd say like six to ten feet underground in your yard. Wow. <laughs> And then just remember where you buried it. That's that's an important part. Yeah, that is that is important. I, I, I mean, would say one of the other approaches. One of the other approaches is like, why are you hiding things from your spouse when you could bring them into the game? Buy a mm. second set of all the things that you currently have, so that we can share. Don't restrict the fun. I was going to say use a null space chamber, but that's actually from the game and not real. So both of your ideas are better on that. <laughs> Or just hide hide your Starfinder books and your Pathfinder books because the Pathfinder ones are bigger. Oh, wow! Wow! <laughs> no. I just wanted to say it before someone in chat said it. <laughs> uh, we do have another question here about saying that there's a pocket-sized Starfinder book up for pre-order and questioning is the Starfinder line ending. No, the Starfinder line is not ending. We do have a pocket edition core rulebook coming out in a few months. The reason for that is because people particularly on our organized play side, tell us they don't like carrying around a lot of really heavy books. So we make a smaller book that they can carry around with it. Um, so this is just something I think we're probably going to be doing more of these going forward just because they're so popular and they're they're designed to go, you know, right along with, with the normal game. So it is simply a more convenient packaging for the book. That is that is all for that. Well, um, we can ask, we can add, that there is some value in the, in particular the pocket edition of the Starfinder Core Rulebook, in that we've incorporated our uh, errata into that edition. So, the first printing of the pocket edition Starfinder Core Rulebook will include all the errata that then will be available for the PDF uh, forms for the book as well. So that's pretty exciting. That that took a lot of work to. Obviously, the, the game has been out for a couple of years, so we went through and. Uh, we had feedback from every corner of the internet, and we scoured it and uh, incorporated a lot of it. So I'm, I'm excited for people to get their hands on it. Definitely, we also had a joke for getting all that <laughs> together. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. We have a question about how many pages um, is Psalm. I think we had one about AA4 as well. These are all 160 page books, like our like our normal, our traditional. Uh, Starfinder books. Let me see if there's any other questions that I missed. What's your favorite playable species from Alien Archive 4? Um, that's going to depend on who. It's still pretty new and it hasn't come out yet. John, do you have a favorite playable species? I mean, speaking to uh, what Joe had mentioned before about how Joe and I split development on these, since Joe was working on the how to staple other creatures into yourself uh, section, he really led the development on a lot of the playable species, with one exception. And that was the one that he wrote himself, which are the Warlanesis. Um, I think Joe's been teasing a little bit that there were some creatures in near space that were like name dropped or uh, illustrated that we never really explored with statistics. And the Warlanesi is one of them. Uh, where they are this luck-based, four-armed uh, creature. Um, and I can't wait for people to see the art because uh, some of the outfits on these uh, creatures are amazing. Uh, so that's my favorite. Yeah, I definitely hoarded all the, the playable species for AA4. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, can, I can run through and say, like, we're, we're picking up the Copaxi, which people have seen on the cover, which is cool, the coral-like folks from uh, Starfinder Organized Play. Starfinder Society. Uh, so that's exciting. And then we have some new stuff too, because we, we do like to do that. We like to pick up the, mo the sort of the most popular and interesting species from organized play uh, in these hardcovers and expand on them uh, where we have a little more room. And then uh, introduce entirely new things. One, one thing I think I'll pick, I would love to just like read this list that I'm looking at of all of them and tell you what they all are, but I guess I shouldn't do that. 
whatever. So I'll pick the uh, N2 colony, which is, uh, it's actually two forms that you could play it as. So one is as just sapient fungus that oozes around and can form limbs and be real gross uh, and do other interesting things. Or it can uh, sort of form a mutual uh, symbiotic relationship with an animal and uplift that animal into sapience. Um, uh, so you can, it's basically up and uplift your own animal <laughs> species where you get to decide sort of what animal you're uplifting, but it just ha happens to have like fungal spores coming out of its head and eyes <laughs> or whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And Lou, do you have a favorite playable race from AA4? <laughs> You know, I'm. I made fun of you earlier, but I actually really am proud of the Extengi. <laughs> That's so my favorite one my too. Own. Wow. <laughs> I'm gonna choose my own. <laughs> I figured it was a softball <laughs> one. <laughs> and I don't know as much about all these races as the rest, so I'm also gonna pick that one because it sounds the coolest. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely not my reason. <laughs> We always have fun stuff in these things. So I, I actually quite quite like looking at the new playable races and, and working out, trying to figure out how many of each we're going to put in there and it's figuring out the, you know, which, which things we have to cut and which things we can keep and everything. All right, we're getting close to the end. So we had promised we were going to make an announcement at the end here. So... I don't remember whether I whether I said I was going to make it or whether I was going to have John or whether John was going to make it. Do you Please remember? Please go John? ahead. Okay. Yeah, so just to let everyone know, um, very soon we will be having a new class play test coming out for Starfinder. We're not really able to say much more about that at this point, but in the near future, keep an eye out. There's a new public class play test, which means there should be a new Starfinder class appearing in a book once we have gotten all of your feedback. So we're super excited about that. Keep an eye out um, and get ready to play test this thing. All right. Um, any from our panel here, does anyone else, anybody on the panel here want to add anything else about any of the books or the beyond that we've been talking about? And I hear um, Gem, Gemma's excitement. I mean, oh my gosh, don't give me an opportunity to talk about Gem more. Or I'll, I'll just Jim, <laughs> Jim is excitement. Game. That is yes. coming out in next spring in 2021. Um, that's a good thing to wrap up. We have uh, the Starship Operations Manual coming out here in uh, July or August, followed by Alien Archive 4. Um, and Galaxy Exploration Manual, and then beyond from that. So and somewhere in there will be this fun little playtest we talked about. So thank you all for joining us. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists, Joe, John, and Lou for making this a uh, fun thing. And hey, everybody, enjoy the rest of the con. And thanks for being here with us at PaizoCon. I'm waving goodbye right now. I'm waving goodbye, goodbye too. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>